So while Glass Rose was something not many were aware of, developer Singh's second game, Another Code, may be a little more recognizable to you. You might be like, oh yeah, it's that DS game with the white-haired anime kind of girl or something. Didn't I get a trophy in Smash Brothers or something with her? Sing, this time, teamed up with Nintendo as their publisher to bring a new point-and-click adventure, this time to the recently released Nintendo DS, that would take advantage of the unique DS hardware. Yeah, you've probably heard that line in every review of a DS game. But just in case, it is important for you to understand that when the two-screened monstrosity that was the OG DS came out in 2004, it was novel, and an adventure game that would have you interact with the environment through the touchscreen seemed like a perfect fit. Such a perfect fit, the devs opted to give the protagonist of this one her own DS that allows her to take pics and read and receive files she finds on DS game cartridges. Yeah, they don't want you to forget that this game is about hardware gimmicks to the extent they uh, put the hardware in the game, but I get ahead of myself. Another code is about 13-year-old girl Ashley Mizuki Robbins who goes to an island to search for her missing father. She teams up with a ghost and enters a mansion so she can find her scientist father and so her new friend, D, as he refers to himself as, can find peace by discovering who he is and how he died. Glass Rose was a game that I think bit off more than it could chew with its, like, a hundred characters. The story of Another Code has about six. Kinda reminds me of the old Silent Hills in that sense, in more ways than just that, actually, with the American teen girl protagonist with dad issues. Like Silent Hill 3, the cast is kept to a minimum, only the essentials here. The story is very charming. Ash is, of course, a bit of a naive teenager who talks to a ghost child, so yeah, they're unlikely to start having nuanced adult conversations or talking complex political theory, but playing as Ash is such a breath of fresh air and an upgrade after going through Jimmy Glass Rose's deadpan adventure. Nice to play like uh, a character who reacts with emotion to the various turns in the story. With only a few stills, the charming character art drives home her emotions nicely. She becomes genuinely likable as she bonds with D and overcomes the hardships ahead. She gets enthusiastic and exasperated exactly where you'd expect her to throughout the story, remaining both likable and believable. Gameplay-wise, Glass Rose also seemed way too ambitious and didn't stick the landing. It's Weird time management and dialogue highlight mechanics seem to take precedent over making an adventure detective point and click game with actual uh, puzzles to solve, and thankfully another code is much more traditional in this regard. Opting for the core of the gameplay to be about interacting with points of interest, collecting items to combine them with those points of interest, and solving riddles. And or figuring out which use of the DS's hardware will uh, trigger a response from whatever's in front of you. It's not working off that glass rose Looney Tune logic of picking up a towel for a bottle to appear on the other side of the game. The novelty, of course, here is the tactile feel offered when interacting with points of interest. Using the touchscreen to move things, smash objects, press buttons, etc. Yeah, I know, this all sounds pretty primitive and commonplace today, but this came out in 2005. The first iPhone was released in 2007. The DS was the first time a lot of people had ever used a touchscreen, at least it was for me. So getting to interact with what was on a display in a game so directly was a huge novelty, and practical even, when it came to, well, pressing keypads and moving things around. Just by, you know, literally touching it. Just, just doing it. Rather than highlighting what you want to interact with or move with a D-pad or control stick. Zero separation here. Even a mouse can't replicate the tactile immediacy of just directly hitting the thing you want to touch. Or, you know, maybe it can. I'm not a pro StarCraft player or anything. To its credit, another code takes things a step further than a lot of DS games did. There's stuff like blowing on the mic and a few other gimmicks I won't spoil. This puzzle specifically is really out there and how you have to interact with the DS hardware to solve it. But you know, since we now live in the future, and most of you watching this video probably interact with touchscreens like every day, or every hour, some of the more basic gimmicks aren't going to feel as fresh, and when the title focuses your attention on something like a crank, and asks you to turn it with the touchscreen, uh, making a big deal out of it, like it's some groundbreaking stuff, uh, it might seem a bit quaint now. 
I think where another code's hardware gimmicks really stand the test of time is in how it chooses to present its world. You move Ashley on the bottom screen from a top-down perspective, and as you walk around, the top screen will display a pre-rendered image showing a first-person perspective of what's in front of you. If there's anything of interest on this image, you can then hit a button to bring it down to the bottom screen where the details can be inspected. You get the classic detail of static pre-rendered images, similar to old point-and-click games like Myst or whatever, with the ease of movement of a 3D environment. It feels great, super intuitive. It's gonna be weird that with the final DS iteration probably getting phased out soon, no matter what Nintendo is saying, in favor of the Switch, and with the Wii U being a commercial failure, we might be entering an era where this kind of dual screen design is inaccessible to devs and a thing of the past. I guess we can always turn our PC monitors sideways. Overall, the puzzles aren't that tricky and the story not too complicated, but I think it's part of the charm. The low difficulty combined with the appealing visuals, quiet, serene environments, you know, it all comes together to create a nice, relaxing experience which you can kick back to and take it easy with. On a personal note, few games remind me more of the early days of the DS than another code. From the various control gimmicks to the literal original DS in the game, even the modern-looking barcode sterile aesthetic of Ashley's t-shirt design, for me, brings to mind the DS hardware's own unique features. Stuff like the corny picto chat function, or just in general the DS's wireless connection capabilities that seemed so fresh and futuristic for handheld console gaming in the system's first few years. The only real big flaw here is value. It's not a long game, my most recent playthrough was under five hours. While Ashley's story always wraps up the same way, how well Dee's story concludes depends on how thorough you were investigating his past and his family records on the island. This can offer some replay value if you mess up the first time, but otherwise you don't get much new on New Game Plus aside from collecting more lore entries. So I'd say get this one on the cheap if you're interested. But wait. Dun dun dun. Which version do you get? So yeah, cat out of the bag, this game was actually called Trace Memory in North America, and not another code like everywhere else. <laughs> but that ain't where the changes end. That's right, the North American version has a different localization. It came out in America a little later and was translated again by Nintendo of America, I assume? I don't know. Someone who felt the need to give Ashley and Dee a bunch of uh, cheesy added jokes and English puns on top of the original dialogue. Check out this comparison of the first scene where Ashley and the amnesiac Dee meet and exchange the predicaments they're in. I feel the same way. How? I have something I want to remember, but I can't. <sighs> Ashley. I feel the same way. How? I have something I try to remember, but I can't. So we're kindred spirits. <laughs> that was really corny, D. Yeah, it's gonna be an oof from me. Does Ashley need to be a smug modern, eye-rolling, lampshading, irony dispenser? I don't know, I recommend going with the European localization if you can, where the characters come across a little more heartfelt. Luckily, we wouldn't have to deal with this issue in the Wii sequel because... Uh, never got a US release. Which means we'll thankfully from here on out never have to refer to this series again by a Fox Kids ass name like Trace Memory. Four years after Another Code, Another Code R, A Journey Into Lost Memories was released on Wii in Japan and Europe. Being a Japan and PAL only release, it of course has beautiful, artsy cover art. The characters only completely visible through their reflection in the water. Ruined a bit though by this brain training ass WH Smith looking stamp. Reading? Ah. Uh, don't tell the gamers we're gonna be doing that. To be honest, it's a bit of a surreal game. First you get this little rinky-dink adventure game on the DS, and then you have this big-ass 3D adventure game on the Wii. And these are the only two games in the series. Before doing a big home console game, you'd think they'd play it safe with a bunch more portable games, which is usually the case with most adventure point-and-click stuff that get their start on handhelds. But with the second game, straight away, Sing went from a five-hour portable game to an over 15-hour console adventure with rebuilt from the ground up perspectives and a whole new control scheme. But that last element, uh, therein lies probably the incentive to do this. They tried to maximize the use of the DS's unique features, so it's logical in a sense to want to do the same for the Wii's. Why bother messing around with the DS anymore when there's a whole new array of opportunities with the Wii's motion controls to experiment with? And yes, 
you get a Wii remote item in the game, which is used for various puzzles. I've rarely seen the Wii's controls, or for that matter, any console's controller hardware and interface maximized for a puzzle game to the extent another code R does. At one point, you have to enter the Wii's home screen to solve a puzzle, so that's how Galaxy Brain this gets. For a lot of gamers, though, even if they get their hands on this game, seeing some of the most inventive uses the Wii Mote has ever had might be a tall order if they're not into very slow-paced games with a lot of chit-chat and a lot of text. But if you also like that on top of creative controller gimmicks, then boy, you're gonna, you're gonna love this game. This time around, Ashley is invited by her father on a bonding camping trip, but on arrival, mysteries involving the nearby tech company her father works at start to manifest when she begins remembering bits and pieces of a childhood visit there with her long-gone mother. Said mysteries uh, sure do manifest slowly because it takes a good hour before things really start going at all. You get your bag stolen straight away on arrival, but other than that, you really have to give proceedings time to percolate compared to the DS outing. In that game, in the first 10 minutes, the overarching mystery is established, and in another 10, you've met your ghost buddy and you're off to explore. Which makes sense, the first Another Code was a portable game, so it stands to reason you may be playing in short bursts throughout your day. Maybe you'll only get in 15 minutes of playtime in one given play session, so it's a nice concession to usually have at least one bit of significant plot development happen in that small time frame. It's just that if the game does that, you're inevitably going to run out of significant plot developments faster, and the game is going to be short. Here, since this is a home console game, I guess they decided to ease up and slow down the pacing, because the devs might have figured I'm sat at home with nothing better to do, and it was just... <sighs> What just heaven? Anyway, luckily the story overall is uh, pretty well written with believable, likable characters, which there are a lot more of now compared to the DS game. Aside from a new younger male sidekick for Ashley, um, well, I guess D in the first game wasn't younger technically. I guess he's like decades old in that game. There's also a wide cast of different players who relate to the central mystery to varying degrees. Unlike the overwhelming cast of Glass Rose, though, here everyone is introduced at a slower pace throughout the entirety of the game, rather than most of them popping up in the first hour. And you have a handy Yakuza 3 flowchart with pictures to keep track of everyone. Glass Rose once again managing to be the worst of both worlds, with its long, protracted, meandering 12-hour story that still decided to introduce almost everyone, like, immediately. I I'm not sure that another code R really strikes a perfect balance, though. You get plenty of long chats with the cast, and it really helps flesh them out, as well as Ashley, who in this game feels even more well-rounded than before. Her love of music is introduced alongside further details about her life outside of the games that we discover as she converses with all the different players. You can even direct her character a bit yourself this time with very important and serious narrative choices. Did you get a boyfriend over the summer? In the grand scheme of things, uh, these choices usually don't have a big effect on anything, but are a fun little way to make her demeanor your own in certain circumstances. The super charming animations really shine. They pretty much make up for the lack of voice acting thanks to how expressive they all are. Problem is, a lot of the time you'll spend quite a while talking to characters that end up having very little impact on things to come. Even your new sidekick here who is searching for his missing dad has his side plot get put in a bin before the final third of the game, and we're told later that it might continue in a future game uh, that will never happen since Sing went out of business. This is a shame because the first Another Code did a great job at tying D's storyline back into the climax. Here that doesn't happen and we're left with just at least a still pretty satisfying conclusion to Ashley's story. The best scenes with Ashley are definitely between her and her dad, and it's a shame the game doesn't have more of them. One of the best is early on when Ashley confronts her father over how useless he's being as a dad and demands to go home. It's pretty sad to watch because you're rooting for these two nice people to finally become a family after all this time, but you can totally understand why there are also very legitimate obstacles and past wounds getting in the way of that. According to an interview on Cubed... Uh, Cubed.com? The devs got a real teenage girl to give them feedback on this scene, and it shows because it hits hard. The game's dialogue, though, also reveals that this game was definitely localized by Brits when, uh, 
Ashley comes across a packet of crisps. What an American teen thing to say. Exploring the world, though, and seeing how Ashley reacts to things is part of the fun. There are little superfluous items to collect, like a music player, which unfortunately for Ashley only contains the soundtrack of the game and not the latest Paramore album. Okay, this was actually originally just a joke about how it's the late 2000s when this game came out and Ashley kind of looks like the type to be into Paramore, but come to think of it, re-watching the only exception video, I'm <laughs> starting to wonder if Hayley Williams played this game. Anyway, once again, another code produces another game uh, that is best enjoyed by kicking back and just chilling out and relaxing to its slow, easy-going vibes. It's not a violent or crass game, a lot of themes of family here. Parents and their relationships with their children drive the entire plot, and the weaker those bonds, the more tragedy that ensues. Pretty much every major character has a relationship with their parents that dictates where they are today, even the villain. And it's only through being honest, the parent working with the child, that in the case of Ashley and her father, they manage to come out on top of the end and stop the baddies. And of course, work towards their own healing. A lot of the game's chill appeal comes from the great visuals. The watercolor pastel aesthetics are really cool. It's impressive for a company previously working with pre-rendered backgrounds and the like to create such a vibrant game. Of course, absolutely the right direction to take with the underpowered Wii in 2009, well into the seventh generation. I'd say though that the puzzles can here and there get a little more complex than the first game too, so it's not totally devoid of brain action. Here's a little advice for the uh, clock puzzle, because of course there's a clock puzzle. You know how many clocks I've had to deal with in my time playing horror and puzzle games? People who don't play games don't know half the weird shit I've had to deal with. Anyway, TGB pro tip, ignore this clock over here entirely. Waste of time, literally. Don't factor it in or you'll mess everything up. Now another code, even in Europe, where I think it was the most popular, uh, wasn't exactly a sales goliath. And with seeing out of commission, we unfortunately never got more another code adventures. Somewhere in a parallel timeline right now, the Wii U got its killer app in the form of an interdimensional brain and other code title, making use of all the console's features. Now these were Nintendo published games and another code got that nod in Smash Brothers, right? So, you know, who knows? <laughs> The vault is never sealed forever. It'd be great to see where Ashley went next in her later years one day, as her and her family became quite an endearing bunch throughout this duology. But with Ashley gone or not, our Sing excursion doesn't end here, because the Another Code universe isn't limited to just her adventures. <laughs> Alright, it's been a while since I've talked in the end slate, but all I've got to say is the usual stuff. Thanks to all my backers, and especially my top backers you're seeing scrolling past you right now. If you want to help support content on niche games such as this, then please consider heading over to patreon.com slash thegamingbridgeshow. Every little helps, your support would be much appreciated. Thanks for watching, and peace out. <laughs>